also worked directly with Kenner, who had the license for the toys and made suggestions for production designs. Schumacher decided to reference the Adam West Batman show, most notably with the cast of Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze, for a 20 to $25 million up front plus a cut of the merchandise, complete with his ice puns. Uma Thurman was cast as Poison Ivy and Alicia Silverstone as Batgirl, who was now Alfred's niece. Batman was recast once again after Kilmer had a falling out with Schumacher by George Clooney. Bob Kane, now 80 but ever the dutiful paid consultant, proclaimed Clooney to be the best Batman ever, even noting his strong chin and a clear jab against the original criticism of Michael Keaton. With the premiere set for June 20th, 1997 and a $15 million licensing ready to go, Warner Brothers was hoping for another hit. It didn't quite turn out that way. While the film opened strong at $44 million, it was $10 million less than the opening for Forever, and the first time since the franchise began that it didn't break the box office opening record. It eventually grossed $107 million domestic and $238 worldwide, making it the weakest showing of the franchise to date. Even worse, the merchandise only grossed $125 million, making for a bomb as for the movie on all fronts. The film was reviled by critics and fans alike, and remains on the list of one of the worst comic book movies of all time. The problem was the, the film tried to ape the Adam West show, but also filled with violent and sexual imagery, from a man being tortured with drugs to poison eye these very adult and sexual puns, that it didn't appeal to adults or kids. Even Schumacher has conceded as much, as during his recorded commentary for the film when the DVD collection was released years later, he just flat out apologizes. Nevertheless, plans for Batman 5 were put into place with the working title of Batman Triumphant. Mark Prodosik was contracted for the screenplay, which would feature Scarecrow and Harley Quinn, now Joker's daughter, as the villains. However, Schumacher's involvement was reviled and he eventually left the project in 1999. Once Clooney stated he wouldn't be coming back as well, that was the official end of this Batman movie series, which began setting box office records and showing that Batman could be taken seriously by adults, but ended up becoming one of the biggest jokes in Hollywood. Sadly, Warner Brothers also lost its chief consultant on the films and Batman's co-creator when Bob Kane passed away on November 3rd, 1998 in Los Angeles, California, survived by his second wife, Elizabeth Sanders, and his daughter from his first marriage, Deborah. While controversial in his treatment of his colleague, Bill Finger, something he himself has later regretted, he was never listened to a significant creator in the industry, helping make one of the greatest characters in all of fiction. Before his death, he would be inducted into the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame in 1994 and the Will Eisner Hall of Fame in 1996, along with a post ominous star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on October 21st, 2015. Of course, on DC's 50th anniversary in 1985, he would be named one of the 50 who made DC great. Did he deserve all the credit for Batman as he claimed throughout much of his life? No. But he definitely deserves some, and for us Batman fans, we'll be, be forever grateful to him. Warner Brothers decided to start fresh with multiple ideas, from a live-action adaptation of the Batman Beyond series to Batman Year One by Darren Aronofsky and Frank Miller, the latter which was sunk when the script was leaked in 2001, revealing that Bruce Wayne was no longer a wealthy playboy, leaving a scathing fan reaction. Another film, Batman v Superman, was proposed with Wolfgang Pearson as a director and Andrew Kevin Walker of Seven fame as the writer, telling a story that pits the two heroes against each other after the Joker kills Batman's girlfriend. It also went to develop, development hell and never surfaced. Back on the comics front, a quarterly Batman comic, Batman Chronicles, was launched in 1995 and lasted to 2001, resulting in a period in which DC was delivering a new Batman comic every week. On top of the various miniseries and one-shots, this is Batman Black and White of 1996, which features various Batman stories told in black and white art, and the epic Batman The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale in 1996-1997. Taking place over 13 issues, with each issue corresponding with a popular holiday for each month, it finds Batman, Commissioner Gordon, and Harvey Dent trying to track down, take down the Falcon crime family while also dealing with a serial killer named Holiday who, you guessed it, only kills on holidays. Serving as a year two storyline, it ultimately ended with a reinvention of the Two-Faces origin and will be a chief inspiration for the upcoming Dark Knight trilogy of the next decade. So successful, it was followed up in 1999 and 2000 by the Dark Victory miniseries, which incorporated Robert's origin into the new mythos, along with setting up the epic lobe sale pairing, which would continue throughout multiple DC and Marvel series. One of the most interesting... 
One of the exciting interpretations of Batman came in the epic future story Kingdom Come by Mark Wade and Kurt Busiak, which told the story of, of a future in which Superman has retired after Joker killed Lois Lane and a new hero, Magog, killed him in, retu- in response. When the jury acquits Magog, despite Superman's testimony against him, Superman retires only to return when the younger, more violent heroes get out of hand. He soon finds himself up against Batman, who finds his mes- methods too harsh. By the end of the story, they have mended their fences, with Superman be- fathering a child with Wonder Woman and Batman being named the, ge- the child's grandfather. Another exciting inter- interpretation came with the relaunched J- Justice League of America, now called JLA, by Grant Morrison and Howard Porter in January of 1997, which found the original lineup of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Martian Manhunter, and Aquaman. Despite being the one human on the team, Morrison quickly established that Batman is a brilliant tactician who can outthink nearly every enemy the team came up, with, came up against. In the opening story in which the JLA took on an invasion of white Martians, every member is captured except Batman, who then managed to infiltrate the ba- base and dispatch the Martians with ease. When one Martian exclaims, how can he do this, he's just a man, Superman manages to counter, yes, the most dangerous man in the world. When the Man of Steel says that, you listen. While many have complained even to this day that Batman feels out of place in the Justice League, this series proved otherwise. However, it would, be, it would take a dark turn and prove how right Superman was in his previous statement in the Tower of Bowels storyline in July and October of 2000. JLA number 43 to 46 by Mark Wade and Howard Porter, in which it's revealed that Batman has developed contingency plans for every member of the Justice League to take them down if they ever turned evil. Unfortunately, his old villain Ra's al Ghul discovered these plans and uses them against uses them for himself. And while they would ultimately be triumphant, it led to Batman being temporarily kicked out of the team, only allowed to rejoin when he and the rest of the teams revealed their identities to each other. As a sign of trust, it highlighted the fault in Batman in that he doesn't trust anyone. And while it may be justified, it doesn't exactly make him a team player. Back in the regular Batman comic books, Batman was established as the head of a larger Bat family, which included Robin, Nightwing, the new Batgirl, Cassandra Cain, and so forth. He would need all the help he could get as a new plot was forming, beginning with Batman Contagion in March of 1996, in which Gotham City is infected by a deadly plague, followed up by Batman Cataclysm in January of 1998, in which the city is devastated by an earthquake. As a result, the U.S. government decides to cut off Gotham City as a lost cause, resulting in the epic No Man's Land storyline in 1999. It was Batman fought to protect it with the remaining Gotham PD. It ended in an epic moment in which the Joker killed Commissioner Gordon's wife, and Batman stepped in to stop Gordon from killing him, stating they must maintain their morale even at the darkest times. It was another moment at Batman's incorruptibility, as the role long established by Jack Leibowitz and Whitney Ellsworth back in the 1940s of No Killing had truly become part of his character. With this story ending, Denny O'Neill retired as editor of Batman Comics, handing the mantle over to Bob Shrek. Back in the cartoon world, Paul Denny and Bruce Timm try something new with the animated series universe with Batman Beyond, which premiered on January 10, 1999 on the Kids WB. Taking place in the future of 2039 of Neo Gotham, a Bruce, Bruce Wayne, Kevin Conroy, in his 70s takes a new protege under his wing, Terry McGinnis, voiced by Will Friedel, whose own father was killed by criminals. Making use of an advanced Batman shoot originally designed to help an aging Bruce Wayne, McGinnis becomes a new Batman, fighting old villains like Mr. Freeze and new, new ones like Derek Powers, who has seized control of Wayne Enterprises. Like his predecessor, Batman the Animated Series, it was an instant hit with fans and critics who most liked, who most liked what was going on during the intervening years as it was slowly filled in, revealing what happened to Nightwing, Robin, Batgirl, and so forth. Most anticipated was what happened to the Joker, which was revealed in the direct-to-video movie Batman Beyond, Return of the Joker, on December 12, 2000. Originally edited down after the events of what happened to the Joker were considered too violent, it eventually got a PG-13 director's cut in 2002. It remains one of the most successful and acclaimed Batman animated movies to date, as was the series, which ended on December 18, 2001. Eventually, this series, along with Batman and Superman, will become a larger part of the animated universe that will include the Justice League and JLA Unlimited. In the comics, Frank Miller decided to try a sequel to his classic The Dark Knight Returns in December 2001, after DC offered him a $1 million up front with The Dark Knight Strikes Back. However, fans were struck by its tone, which was more satiric and the art more haphazard, leading to poor reviews. 
It did introduce some new things, such as Superman and Wonder Woman's daughter, Zora, but it is generally considered a disappointment. Nevertheless, it ended up being the top-selling comic of the year. Then in December 2002, Jeff Loeb and Jim Leo Lee teamed up for the Hush storyline, taking place in Batman number 608 to 619, in which Batman takes on a new villain with a connection to his past, Hush, eventually revealed to be Thomas Elliot, a then unknown childhood friend. Many fans at first speculated it would be a resurrected Jason Todd, but he would only later turn up in the storyline Under the Hood in November of 2004, in which he's now a vigilante under the Joker's former moniker Red Hood. He would, he would challenge Batman's no-killing rule, stating that an exception should be made for the Joker, something even Batman doesn't agree with. As for Hush, it would go on to sell 150,000 issues, an issue, and while the story does add some nice twists, such as Batman revealing his identity to Catwoman and beginning a romance, its anticlimactic ending left some fans disappointed. It is considered a highlight for Jim Lee's art career, especially in the flashback scenes that look almost like a water paint, color painting. Another exciting entry in the comics also came with Gotham Central in December of 2002, written by Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka, with the art by Michael Lark, which followed the regular cops Gotham PD as they dealt with both the villains, villains and Batman, who were shown as a mythic figure in the series. While highly acclaimed, it only lasted for 40 issues, ending on April 2006 due to its, due to its high concept and mature nature. Meanwhile, Batman fandom really took hold when Sandra Collar, Sandy Collar premiered his Batman short Batman Dead End on July 19, 2003, which featured the Dark Knight fighting the alien and the predator. Made for $30,000 to showcase his talents to studios, it has been universally praised by fans and professionals alike. Both Kevin Smith and Alex Ross called it one of the best Batman films ever made. It remains a standard for fan films. Check it out on YouTube. It is pretty darn good. In the comics, another significant one came along with Planetary Batman Night on Earth in 2003 by Warren Ellis and John Cassidy, which finds that the dimension-hopping heroes of Planetary dealing with every version of Batman, from the Adam West to Tim Burton's. However, it was a speech to murderer John Black that stands out, as he explains why he does what he does in trying to ensure that no one loses their parents or loved ones like he did. It's the moments that got to the essence of Batman. It's a brilliant story in the classic series. Back at the movies, Warner Brothers finally decided to reboot the series, this time with writer, with writer David Goyer and director Christopher Nolan, who was signed in 2003. However, instead of a fanciful series like Burden and Schumacher, they were going to craft a realistic, from-the-ground-up Batman, finally detailing his origin story on the big screen. Using The Man Who Falls, Daughter of the Demon, and Batman Year One as their sources, they set out to make a new standard in Batman movies, including des- even designing a new Batman- Batmobile, the Tumblr. Christian Bale was signed as Batman, who was originally considered too skinny due to his previous work on The Machinist, but quickly bulked up. If if not a bit too much at one time, at one point the crew jokingly called him Fat Man. Most significantly, the film had to deal with the internet before it even premiered, something every film has to do nowadays, as the script was leaked and the footage from Chicago, where it was filmed, got online. Thankfully... The fans like both, encouraging the studio, and when the film premiered on June 15, 2004, Batman Begins opened at $73 million in positive, positive reviews. The two consistent negatives were an anticlimactic ending and Katie Holmes as Rachel Dawes, a childhood crush now dis- who was now district attorney, and who the viewers just didn't find compelling. The film did end up grossing $374 million worldwide, enough to encourage Warner Brothers to sign a sequel to everyone's benefit. And like the first uh, episode, I'm going to leave you hanging after that first movie. Uh, like I said, it's getting around the half hour again. I like to keep those episodes around that length. And like I said, and of uh, course, who wants to listen to me talk this much? Thank you again for this uh, part two of A History of Batman. And join me again. Well, I'm pretty sure we'll probably finish up with part three. And once again, thanks for joining A History of Comics Podcast. Now, it is uh, August uh, 2nd, 2018. Time for a review and a shout-out. First and foremost, uh, favorite comic book of the week, Mr. Miracle by uh, Tom King and uh, Mitch Jurds, which uh, continues the epic storyline as, uh, once again, uh, uh, Scott Free and Mr. Miracle and his wife Big Body are planning their son's uh, Jacob's first uh, birthday, while at the same time having to deal with the uh, offer of peace that Darkseid made to them. He, Apocalypse will end the war with New Genesis and return. Jacob is to hand, be handed over to be raised by Darkseid. Uh, once again, he King does a brilliant job 
balancing both the mundane and the epic as uh, Spree and uh, Bardo discuss uh, how to plan their son Jacob's birthday. Interesting note. Uh-